Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am Jeremy Vaney. This is our Undoing Radio. That is what you're listening to. Well, I guess this is the first episode since the insurrection. So maybe you'd think, yeah, he's going to talk about that insurrection. But I'm not going to talk about that insurrection because um, it's uh, been talked about. And the historical context has been given by others better than I could give it. Uh, and I think we all get it, right? The only thing I will say here about it, I guess, is um, something I wrote on Facebook, which uh, is something to keep in mind, which is that Donald Trump has said and written on Twitter in all caps over and over again for almost four years, uh, the words witch hunt, just over and over, witch hunt, witch hunt, witch hunt, which, of course, uh, he knew was a lie. He was saying it in the context of, they're coming after me, it's a witch hunt. But when his followers hear that enough, it sort of becomes an instruction. So if the insurrection looked a little bit more like a modern-day version of um, coming after the monsters with torches and pitchforks, than it did any sort of organized act of war, that could be why. They do fancy themselves God-fearing Christians after all. Somehow. A lot of them. Uh, yeah. Which isn't to say that there isn't an organized faction or a bunch of factions. Within that, it's just to say that they, they hide amongst that mob. They used the mob as cover. But we all know that, right? Anyway, uh, so what I've been thinking about lately, uh, more and more, is what I want to talk about here, which is uh, getting off of social media altogether. Um, I think I'm on the verge of abandoning, abandoning ufology uh, as a thing that I want to be an entity in, and I will be talking about that. Actually, by the time you hear this, I will have talked about that on my other show, The Experience. And um, I, I think it's going to be a short-lived second run on The Experience. And um, so if you want to hear more about that, you can um, check out my reasoning there. Um, but, I mean, it's similar to why I want to get off social media. At least some of the flavors are there of... Well, I guess I guess with ufology, it's more like um, we now see the real world deadly and dangerous ramifications of believing these nonsensical things like QAnon or like, uh, you know, Trump is a working class hero <laughs> or whatever, whatever it is, um, not seeing through the facade of the criminal uh, who is propping up the very power structure that you um, that is either oppressing you in the case of politics or in the case of ufology that you claim to see through with your special powers of not being a sheeple. Um, somehow they can't quite see through this. A lot of a lot of them. In any event, you know, not everything is going to be your your battle. Right? Like, there's just too much awful in the world and too much organized awful. Like, if you fought every battle, you wouldn't have a bank account because, you know, odds are your bank, you know, helped fund Hitler. Odds are maybe the car you drive, that car company, at one point helped fund Hitler. So, you know, the marriage of corporation and banking and fascism runs deep. And um, there's no there's no getting away from uh, ties to fascism or ties to slavery or ties to districting neighborhoods to keep certain people down and other people up and all all of it. So that's my preface to saying you don't have to go down the. Um, you don't I'm not saying you have to quit social media. <laughs> I'm not saying this is your fight and that this is all of our fight or anything like that. In fact, I'm not using the word fight because uh, aren't you sick of war language already? When does that end? In any event, 
I'm thinking of quitting social media myself um, and or just using it as a form of advertising. So for me, this would be primarily Facebook and Twitter, although I'm probably still on MySpace somewhere. But uh, who knows? Who knows what's going on in MySpace? Nobody. It just, it seems that social media is not a good way to keep up with each other. And one problem is that you can write something and someone may see it and take offense to it. And then years later, um, you don't mean it anymore. Or you never mean it in the first place. It meant it in the first place. It was a joke. And that person didn't know it was a joke and they just never said anything. And so... Uh, then they hold this grudge against you or they talk about you behind your back or they defriend you or whatever it is for this one thing. And you would never do that to someone in real life. And I'm not thinking of anything like that's happened to me. I mean, I'm sure it has just odds are, but, uh, but I'm not actually not thinking of anything specific when I say this, I'm just saying it's a problem. It's a problem that you can be, um, forever scarlet lettered by one thing you wrote or said, and that's okay with people. Like that's not the way relationships work in the real world one-on-one or in front of each other. So somehow we've deluded ourselves into believing that social media is okay, despite all of the bad stuff that we know about it. Right. I mean, I'm going to try to limit it to things that you may not have thought about, like maybe that, but maybe you have. Uh, but there are, you know, the fact that uh, getting likes apparently triggers chemical response in the brain and you can get addicted to looking at your phone for likes on Facebook and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then of course there's the fact that the social media companies themselves are just using you to sort of sell your information to other companies and those companies on their best day, or I guess they're just advertising crap to sell you, but then on their worst day, they're, uh, you know, funneling your information to Russian disinfo agents who figure out how to get you to vote for fascists, right? Like, these aren't good. But they're to be expected, I suppose, at some at a certain point, because um, as I'll make the case in a future episode with Dr. Tyler Cokejohn, we of the Western mind seem to have a, a, a good old bad habit nowadays of leading with our pollution. So we want to go out into outer space and we lead with our pollution. Um, and we'll talk about what that means on that show, you know, in physically. But mentally and emotionally, we also lead with our pollution. And it's hard enough to do that one-on-one. It's hard enough to meet somebody and put your uh, expectations onto them, your prejudices onto them, uh, your cultural filters. Um, I was going to say baggage. I guess that is baggage. Um, however you grew up, uh, your own nervousness of meeting somebody, um, of whatever you may have heard about them or not heard about them. Maybe they're completely unknown and that's scary. Like all this stuff that goes on in the snap of a finger when you meet somebody between the two people um, that's completely unhealthy and means that they're not actually meeting each other as they are. It's hard enough to do that in real life and navigate that and be self-conscious of that. It's really hard when um, you're either anonymous online or you've got the privileges of anonymity. I mean, I have privileges of anonymity, even, um, Even if I use my real name and the privilege is, uh, I'm not there to get punched in the face (laughs) for something I say, right? Like, so the id can run wild if the id ever existed. The, uh, the, the worst of you, the most arrogant of you, which is really you, uh, comes out. And the reason I say it's you is because, uh, you as the um, the self-center, you know, is a thought construct, is a projection of the brain, is, as it sees itself in the world, a lie. Um, 
And the only way to sustain that lie is um, to have a sense of control. And one way to have that sense of control is to form consensus around how things work. Thus, religions are born and political systems are born. And then we worship those and we say, this is what reality is, or this is what patriotism is, or whatever it is. But then there's the online version uh, of control, which is, I can bash you in the head a thousand times, uh, you know, mentally, mentally abuse you, troll you and all that sort of stuff. Or hack you and, 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 you know, if you're really cruel, you know, and smart, you can do that sort of thing. Um, but essentially it becomes this sort of torture chamber. And it's even if you're not torturing other people, you're being tortured uh, either by them often or by your own by yourself. I mean, I think constantly looking at your phone for likes is a form of torture. <laughs> If that's what you do, but, uh, also I think, um, the anxiety of being criticized because it's public, I guess that's the problem, right? Like when you have a one-on-one conversation, again, it's hard enough in person to criticize someone unless you're going to be jokey with them. But if you're one-on-one and you're being jokey with someone, Either that person knows you're joking or you know who that person is and maybe they've got like Asperger's syndrome or something and you know that about them and uh, so you you know that they're not going to get the joke so you don't make the joke. Uh, you know how to read the room. You don't know how to read the room in a chat room. You don't know how to read the room on Facebook, really, unless you keep editing and editing and editing your friends down to only those people who agree with you or who you know in real life. Um. Otherwise, you're liable to end up with a whole bunch of people who don't get that you're making a joke. Um, and then that feels like a criticism. Uh, and then you have a hostility toward them, and none of that is real. I'm just using that as an example. Again, I have nothing, nothing has happened recently that makes me say any of this out loud. I've just been thinking it lately. However, there is one aspect uh, to the dangers of social media that I can get a little bit personal with. Um, well, I, on a previous episode and another season, of course, I talked about uh, Carol and I, my wife Carol and I, in, in real life, in real life, <laughs> had these friends who then became QAnon people who... Uh, became testy about it with us online, and that translated into um, the real-life defriending of us, not just online. Um, We defriended them because we didn't want to hear about it anymore, and then they took that as a real affront and decided not to be friends with us anymore. So there's there's that part, which is... Um, again, we see this, like if it were happening in real life, one-on-one or to all of us together, we could probably talk about it, work it out. Um, but online it's like any challenge to whatever it is you're into, uh, translates into an all out assault and rejection of who you are as a person. And I've done something similar with people, uh, in terms of politics Um, I mean, there are certain things that are unacceptable. Of course, QAnon is unacceptable. I feel like we could have probably maybe talked them out of it in real life before they got too deeply involved, but not to be, uh, white supremacy is obviously, you know, that's, it's off the table. You're out. So, uh, but then there are other things in politics like being, you know, a neoliberal who wants great political change, but doesn't actually, uh, sees that things need to change, but really just want to go back to the way things were prior to Trump because they were sort of comfortable uh, or comfortable enough. And when I see this in my friends online, even with the ones whom I've known in real life, uh, even if they're just posting about it on their own timeline, not to me, it feels like an affront to me personally. Like I take it personally and I don't know what that mechanism is that kicks in online where it doesn't kick in in real life. Like if we were just having a conversation, we would either just have a conversation about it and I'd give my point of view and they'd give theirs and I'd try to 
persuade them and maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't, but life would go on. Uh, or I would say, well, that's just so and so. That's just how they are. Who cares? And I wouldn't even bother. Uh, you know, I would just, uh huh, them. Yes, yes, uh huh. But, um, over the last four years, politics has just been such at the forefront that it's easy to take one subject that you're focusing on and make that the end all be all of your relationship with people. And I don't like that about myself even. Um, like I'll see it online. I'll see it in words, uh, their political views. And I'll be like, you know, shouldn't they know better? It's like I get upset. <laughs> and then naturally I'll get Carol involved just to say, hey, look at this, which is code for take my side. And she's nice. So she's going to be like, yes, dear. <laughs> uh, and then you feel justified. Like I like you start guessing what people's motives are in what they're writing or um you know, you feel the pressing urge of the moment um, that everything needs to change drastically. And these people aren't moving fast enough. And yet they're supposed to be the ones who fancy themselves uh, f free minded liberal people. And so what's wrong with them and all of that? And it just takes on this hyper emotional um, space in your mind that it wouldn't were these real conversations. So who needs this? You know, like these are things that now I've got to watch in myself as I interact online. Like who needs to monitor themselves more than necessary? Like, why are we doing this to ourselves? Cause I know I'm not the only one who does that. I see it all the time. And, you know, I mean, we guess people's motives in, in real life. Um, but there's something about guessing them online where it becomes this tactical, you know, chess game in your head of like, what, are they, what do they really mean? And then, you know, maybe their friends start attacking you for uh, attacking them. And then you find yourself in like this battle for some reason that and all of it's just words on a screen at the end of the day. So it's like you can't have that real one-on-one -on -one connection with somebody. And in place of that, you're having um, your shadow boxing. <laughs> you're, 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 you're arguing to yourself. You're talking to yourself, but you're projecting it on them. You see? And they may not know where you're coming from. They, they're just posting something innocent. But also, I often text uh, on Facebook from my phone. And so my responses to people when I'm upset, you know, my, my, my chubby little fingers are going faster than my tiny keyboard allows. And before you know it, I've misspelled every other word and they think I'm drunk <laughs> and that I can't convince them that I don't drink, that I just misspelled every other word and posted it before spell checking, you know, wash, rinse, repeat. So I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, who does? And yet, um, here we still are using this and saying, well, this is the future. This is forward thinking. This is what we got. You know, like just in denial of the phone that also exists or the allowing relationships to naturally dissipate as they would uh, and as they used to prior to the Internet. I guess what I'm saying is maybe it's unnatural to have like a thousand friends. Right. So as this season shapes up and I thought it was going to be a potpourri of stuff and now it's like clearly is about violence. It seems like, you know, appropriate to do this episode on whether or not, you know, social media is all it's cracked up to be. What about using the phone as a phone? What about actually talking to someone again? Can't we just do that? I mean, you know, one overarching question that is inherent to all of this is. If we can all list and we all can um, the ways in which social media is terrible uh, and it's often terrible, you know, like versus how it's not. If you did the pros and cons, I think the cons outweigh the pros, right? Like, can you think of what's good and uh, that you can only do on social media? I mean, outside of advertising keeping up with grandma or whatever. I don't know. Do people still do that? Um, what's good about it really? And yet here we are knowing that 
and doing it anyway. And we're still on there anyway. And we're still putting uh, an emphasis on being online to the extent that we're not in the world anymore. And so as the world goes to heck in a handbasket, um, I guess we can just pretend like that's going to either not happening as some people do, or is just always perpetually going to be gradual and not really affect us. But I think what we see with the insurrection, um, if I can circle back here, I guess, uh, is that there is a gradualness to things. There's a buildup. And then at the snap of a finger, um, everything changes, right? So you look at this insurrection, you go, whoa, where did that come from? Well, it came from not just four years of Trump. It came from decades of Fox News. It came from um, decades prior to that of the uh, evangelical right doing uh, grassroots politics, getting into the school systems, on and on. Uh, the corrosion that has to happen to build up to this. And then, of course, the perfect storm is there's a pandemic. There's a growing online um, conspiracy theory. And so now people are stuck in their homes and worship online-ness. And so they go there and learn about this conspiracy theory and make themselves even angrier and angrier. And... Um, I suppose without the pandemic, it's possible that QAnon and uh, white nationalism and all of the sort of factions don't all come together online and um, try to do something as stupid as that. Uh, although Trump would have tried to find a way to make it happen because how else is he going to stay in power and out of jail? But anyway... I think it might not be worth posting pictures of cats and stuff for a few friends or articles or off the cuff things that are haha -ha funny uh, as the world is collapsing around us. I mean, at some point we've got to, we've got to acknowledge that within ourselves. Right. And you can only do that on your own alone. And what kind of aloneness can we have if we're constantly online? And constantly asking questions to each other to make that aloneness um, a group effort because <laughs> we don't want to be alone with ourselves. Then we have to, you know, look at the mirror and who wants that? So if you can keep asking these I mean, you know, asking questions, of course, in uh, most contexts is good. But there comes a point where they become uh, a deflection or a means to not be silent. Um, and really everything we do is a means to not be silence. And so this is that one step removed. We don't even want to be silent anymore. We want to be distracted. We want to be uh, immersed in externalness from the comfort of our own homes. Because the real external environment or the interconnecting environment that we treat as merely an external environment, the environment you know, that we're all embedded in and live in and breathe uh, is not going to sustain us any longer. And so what do we do when we're with each other and we know that? We make jokes. We have some sort of snide, cynical comeback to it. Or we've got a little frowny face. You know, you could do your little emoticon, your little sad tear emoticon. Uh... Or you could deny it and say, no, that's not what the science says, because these four scientists paid for by these corporations um, call it all into question. Right? We can do these false equivalents. <laughs> these four people are equal to the entire planet of science. Um, or your own eyes, your own sensations. We can teach ourselves not to trust those. I mean, anything to not be alone with this. And we're trapped again in the illusion of the gradual because it hasn't happened yet. So, you know, 
we're inching up to the cliff and we think that we're always going to be inching up to the cliff. There's never going to be a moment when we actually go over that cliff, is there, until there is. And it'll seem so sudden. What happened? So how do we prepare for that? Because that is what's here. That's what's at our door. How do you prepare for that? You can't prepare for that with anyone else. I mean, sure, you can build a bunker. (laughs) You can stock it up with, like, freeze-dried food or something. But that's not what we're talking about. That's not really what this is about. This always gets back to who are you in this moment. And that is not a question for a support group. That's not a question for a, you know, a weeknight chat after work with some wine, some friends. Or a joking circle. Or I'll watch the late show guys make jokes about it. That's good enough. That's as if I've done something. That's as if I've cared. I've reacted to their stimuli. And that's, that's action enough. Of course, I'll, I will still keep, if I do get off social media, I'll still keep rndoing.com going and perhaps even open up the message boards, if not the whole website, for free to the public. And if people want to chat with me, we can chat there. But because we're chatting there, we'll know that, um, you know, this is a serious place, <laughs> Right which doesn't mean there aren't jokes and stuff, but it means that we're not going to get bogged down in the, the sleep of social media um, of trying to relate to each other that way so much. Again, this is all still hypothetical. Um, later this year, we're going to be doing a, uh, Carol and I are going to be doing another living mysteries symposium, which will be online. And so I imagine I will want to stay online on social media to promote that. But after that, eh, it's pretty up in the air. Flip a coin. I mean, if time is an illusion, why are we all trying to occupy it? Am I right? Isn't jazz about the pauses between notes? (laughs) I don't know what I'm saying anymore. I just know that my, my days of collecting friends to have them are long gone. And I do get sick of seeing people under the title friend who I've never communicated with. I've just accepted their friend request. But then do I really care when I do end up communicating with them? A lot of the times, no. Sometimes I'm surprised. But it's just, it's a weird thing too, because you, have you noticed like you set the tone online for the nature of discourse And it can backfire. So like if I'm jokey a lot of the time, I can post something serious and the comments will all be jokes and snide remarks or the first few will be because it's like that's how you get typecast. Um, And you do it to yourself, right? Um, But we don't do this necessarily in real life, although I guess we, to a point, I guess like in high school and college, maybe you get pegged as a certain character and then you start responding because that's how you... Uh, in your insecurity, you know, maintain friendships. You don't think you can be your real self. You have to be what that other person wants. But I don't think in adulthood um, it works that way so much because uh, we grow up and we get jaded and we don't care. (laughs) We care far less about our image and about all these sort of insecurities. Um, But that mechanism still follows you online, whether you're, you're a kid or an adult. And the mechanism is like, Uh, However people perceive you or receive you is sort of the character you become to them. And it's hard to break out of that. Uh, This is where Gary Coleman ends up killing himself. I I, I don't know that that's true. Did he kill himself? I made that up. Okay. (laughs) I just dated myself though, didn't I? Uh I guess if I can't stop making jokes and laughing, then why should I expect anyone to take me seriously? But that's not the point. The point is, I think we all suffer these things on some level. And why are we suffering through them? Because we're told that this is the world we've got to live in now. Well, not if we just use the phone as a phone again. Not if we just have conversations again. 
Not if we stop leading with our pollution. I mean, remember when going online was supposed to be about the vast stores of knowledge and, oh, look at all this. And then what did it become? It became like porn and distraction and political lies, you know, fractured politics and then fortifying yourself against the world through your point of view, just blocking out and having logarithms of various websites block out for you based on your interest, other points of view. Um, you know, we're narrowing ourselves down into boxes, into this tiny, tiny little box. And it's no wonder so many of us are angry because all of this is like fairly unconscious. Um, and some of it is being done to us, but it's always with our permission or else we just get offline. Right? So much as with anything in the world of spirit, uh, I would say that we don't have time for this anymore. We're out of time. With what time is left, it is time to focus on what's important. And how are we going to ever know what that is? If we're taking selfies for compliments, fishing for likes, and more and more views that are completely meaningless, to not sit with ourselves, to understand what meaning is in the first place. 